and so forth, conventions and all of that. Another of his ideas involved a center for neighborhood youth. Here they could have their activities in safety. They could be protected. What stood in the way of you and your dream? A number of people that I talked to were interested at first, and then later on they petered out. There were over the years many, many plans for it that never quite materialized. Yeah, one of the biggest reasons for that is money. <laughs> but for Tim Samuelson, who in the early 80s worked for the Landmarks Commission, the dreams were persistent. I was very interested in the history of the old black metropolis Bronzeville area. And when I joined the Landmark Commission in 1983, I had been concerned over the years as I watched these properties deteriorate, knew that they were eventually going to slip away but were irreplaceable, and made a suggestion that these buildings be collectively nominated for landmark status in hoping that if you told the story of these buildings, which was such a great story, that people might step forward and rescue these buildings before they kind of went to the inevitable fate of just deteriorating to the point that they would either fall down or be demolished. Samuelson submitted a report to the Landmarks Commission in 1984, revised it a decade later, and made a strong pitch for the preservation of the 8th Regiment Armory. There were a number of community members interested in the building for its history in terms of what it served as during the Bronzeville era. And the recognition of Bronzeville's historical significance became a matter of public policy. Mayor Daly put together a blue ribbon committee uh, uh, for Bronzeville. Which consisted of neighborhood and different agency um, uh, dignitaries that would look and see where they could find funding to save some of these historic treasures in Bronzeville. By the spring of 1996, the city sprucing up of Bronzeville's public spaces was well underway. But the development corporation that owned the armory had failed to pay its property taxes, and it was on the verge of losing the building. At that moment, the armory seemed doomed. But in the summer of 1997, a group of architectural and drafting students at Dunbar High made a major contribution to the building's salvation. Their teacher was trying to find them summer work. I got in contact with my mentor, Wendell Campbell, and asked him, did he know any projects that would be appropriate uh, for something that students could do and that I could actually get them involved in around the city. And I asked him how many students he had, and he said 21. <laughs> so he uh, gave me some information, uh, which led me on to uh, uh, seeking out the Armory Project. And based on that, uh, I got in contact with uh, the person who was in charge of it at that time, uh, General Frank Bacon. Me, I'm not an architect. Based on that, uh, I found out that he was looking to actually uh, renovate and do a, a redevelopment of this building, but he uh, had a funding problem. Based, so in order to resolve that, I asked, could our students get involved? So what we did with the 21 students is form a separate company. What we tried to do was get the, make the project as real as possible. And uh, we provided... Uh, Mentors from the, our, our own company, eight of the fellows that volunteered, and, and ladies, I should say, that volunteered to work with the students. And um, I actually assisted them uh, from the beginning, you know, on, as far as giving them some exercises on um, how to evaluate a neighborhood. Uh, we had a site team, we had a uh, design team, we had a computer analysis team and we had uh, an, a model team. So they went out there, took pictures, and they identified the buildings around uh, the armory, and then they, they learned about land use. Um, we definitely um, took that as an opportunity to introduce, introduce them to planning. What the students produced were models, the first concrete vision of how the old armory might be transformed into a school, and then they sold the project. And I told them at the end of the, the summer they would have to make a presentation to uh, school officials as well as their parents and so on, what they've been doing. Public presentations were not something these young people had done before. Uh, no, this was their, their first experience, and um, it was one that uh, was a challenge for them. We also uh, 
put them through this um, half day of just uh, practicing their, their public speaking and helping them to be confident. They made the presentation on what could be done with the armory. And at the uh, presentation was uh, General Bacon was there, the Congressman Rush was there. But, and uh, it was very well received. And uh, out of it came scholarships for the students, also a new, renewed interest in terms of doing something with the armory. But I think that they helped add to the enthusiasm in the community at large about the importance of saving this building. It gave us some ideas as to what could be done. It gave the, the, uh, the architects who were paid, architects of record, it gave them some ideas as to what could be, as to what could be done. So yes, it was a very good program, a summer program for the kids, which gave them a start, gave us a start, and gave everybody a start. The Board of Education acquired the armory in December of 1997. Last October, the project was fully funded and work began on what some might call the ultimate fixer-upper. I said to myself, oh God, did we bite more off than we could chew. We wound up with uh, asbestos, we wound up with undermined foundations, I mean it was a wreck from top to bottom. I said, we're never going to be able to restructure this, we're never going to be able to revitalize this, rebuild this. The roof was halfway missing, we had trees growing inside the building, on top of the building. Uh, we had uh, structural defects in the, uh, the steel that supported the gymnasium, or the, we call it the drill hall. A year later, they, or less than a year later, you walk into that place and you know you would not recognize it. Uh, it it's just they, it, it's absolutely been transformed. Throughout the area here we had to excavate uh, all of the concrete and remove all of the uh, the old uh, drill floor, uh, put in the underground uh, plumbing system, uh, underground electrical system and then prepare it for the uh, new gymnasium floor that you can see here. It's just beautiful. Now, you know, they've maintained the exterior facade and the interior brick walls and brickwork. And of course, the drill floor is absolutely magnificent because you see way to the top with the, you know, with the arched uh, roof. It's just absolutely magnificent. We've been on a fast track here for over a year. So we contracted this job with the PBC in January. And we've done millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of work in the last uh, six to seven months. What they've done is they've raised, you know, it's, you know, it's like they've restored the Titanic. And what's emerged here is something that seldom happens in a restoration project. Often in historic preservation, you have to wind up with what they call adaptive reuses that aren't often the best match that you can get. And sometimes things are done that are at the expense of the historical integrity of the space. But this one fits just like a glove. How has this been a special project for you? Well, over the years we've gotten uh, many opportunities to do buildings, but I think that for me an architect has to be identifiable with the community in which he lives. He has to be a part of that. He has to leave part back in the community. I live in that community. I went to school in that community. I've seen the community go from a slum to offering a, a, a future to many. And I feel like uh, it has been very good to me. And uh, it's something that I'm very proud of being a part of. Did you think that that building would ever come back? Yes. It had to, and there was no way this commu community should lose it. And now it belongs to more than the community. Bronzeville Military Academy is making a strong pitch to students across the city. We think that we're the best that's going. We think that we have the best curriculum that's going. It's not going to be for everyone. We understand that. And they anticipate that there will probably be a large dropout rate mainly because uh, uh, it's not going to be an easy road to hold. For, for these young people, we're going to try to make a significant difference in their lives. I wanted a lot of discipline in the school because usually um, most schools don't have it. Yes, and as you look at these students today, listen to William Barnett's response to a question asked a little more than three years ago during the Armory's darkest days. You'd like to see this place still standing and perhaps restored? 
I think it could be a monument, but above that, it could be a mighty fine teaching institution. And for the students of the new Bronzeville Military Academy, that's exactly what it's become. For Chicago Tonight, this is Rich Samuels. 140 freshmen from all over the city are enrolled in the Bronzeville Military Academy this year. I hope you enjoyed Rich's special report. We thank you for watching. I'm Phil Ponce, and I hope to see you next time. Produced in Chicago by WTTW.